Hello everyone and welcome to the History Hotline, the hottest line for all things black history and beyond. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 78 of the History Hotline. My name is Deanna Lincook and as always I will be your host today. Now as you can see from the title, today's episode is entitled Was Winston Churchill Really Racist? Now this debate This is Winston Churchill racist debate or the variety of iterations on the same topic that are kind of rolled out almost seasonally, shall we say, by Good Morning Britain and the likes. Um, You know, this is not what this is going to be, I hope. And I do feel bad in ways for kind of, (laughs) no offence, but reducing the podcast to this kind of clickbaity good morning britain debate but don't worry piers morgan isn't here um and it's not going to descend into chaos because it's only me um but i have watched several versions of this conversation of similar conversations that tend to boil down to you know is winston churchill a hero or a villain and i think that in itself is problematic because it suggests that if he is a hero everything he did was heroic or if he was a villain, everything he did was villainous, which isn't the case at all. He's a nuanced, complex character, just like any other human being. Um, and I hope this podcast will essentially answer the question that I've posed. Don't get me wrong, we will speak about the comments he's made and his actions that would lead people to believe he's racist, and we'll look at the definition of racist and we'll see if they fit. Um, but also to kind of understand, um, you know, that people within history are not just, you know, on paper, good or bad. There is nuance, there's complexities to their character um, and to their actions as well um, and to the things that they say. And that being said, this podcast won't get into every single comment or action ever said or done by Winston Churchill but it will explore some of them most of them um, in regards to race and you know points where he has been labeled as saying racist remarks or labeled as being racist um I am not here to talk about World War II today it's just not what this episode will be about um the title is you know is Winston Churchill was he racist it's not you know was he a good wartime prime minister did he lead England to victory, did he defeat Hitler, that's not what this podcast is about, there are many forms of media about that, if that's what you'd rather, Um, this is about his actions and his comments and whether they were racist or not racist, um, and how they kind of fit into how we see history, you know, looking back at it from a point where our moral compasses, society-wise, have changed. Um, And so, with all that being said, a little biography on Winston Churchill. If any of you just happen to not know who he is, um, he was born on the 30th of November, 1874, um, which I always find interesting because the 1800s do seem like a world away, especially for a figure that is also so prominent in, like, more modern histories of World War II, for example. Um, So, he was born in 1874, in um, Blenheim Palace, Oxfordshire. Um, He was of rich aristocratic ancestry. Um, He was very wealthy, um, born into a very wealthy family. Um, And although he didn't do too well at school, he had a fascination with the military and he joined the Royal Cavalry in 1895. Um, So he started off as a soldier, a part-time journalist, writing... Um, as he went on his travels um, with the Royal Cavalry. He travelled around Cuba, Afghanistan, Egypt, South Africa, um, and then went on to launch his political career in the early 1900s, um, which we'll get into more when we think about some of the comments that he made, because it was at that time he made those comments. Um, You might be thinking, why? Why this episode today? Well, I can't lie to you. I planned this episode in... December last year I think it was around November December time and I started to research Winston Churchill because just that conversation of you know is he racist is he not and 
I know what history can do to people. Um, I know that things can be misquoted. I know that things can be taken out of context. I know that people have an idea of of a historical figure or an event or a moment and they will run with it throughout the historiography. And so I kind of wanted to explore, you know, why he was truly so bad and get a range of sources to do that. Um, And so I started this research in like December and then I just let it go because I just really didn't want to do it. But every time I come back to my episode notes, which are on about 150 page document now because there's been so many episodes, um, I keep seeing that this episode has just not been, you know, finished or released. Um, And so I thought this week would be the time. Now, My starting point for the podcast was an article published in 2020 during the Black Lives Matter protest whereby his statue was defaced. It wasn't pulled down. There was no Edward Colston moment, but it was uh, defaced. And so were other Winston Churchill statues in other parts of the world. And I read this article by a man called Richard Toye. It was a CNN article and it was called Yes, Churchill was a Racist. It's time to break free of his great white men view of history. This article was written by a man called Richard Toye, who is also co-author alongside Bill Schwartz and Stephen Fielding of a book called The Churchill Myths. He also writes on Churchill in other books and publications, and these include Lloyd George and Churchill, Rivals for Greatness, Churchill's Empire, The World That Made Him and The World He Made, and The Roar of the Lion, the untold story of Churchill's World War II. And also, um, which came out most recently in 2020, Winston Churchill, A Life in the News, um, which, as I said, came out in 2020. Um, and this makes uh, Richard Toy somewhat of a, an expert in this, this man and his affairs, um, and a credible source, I hope you would agree. Also, I will be calling on the wisdom of many other experts um, and historians primarily that research Churchill, the war and things like that um, and have, you know, created um, opinions and written about um, Churchill's character in a variety of forms because I'm no expert on Churchill, as you might well know. Um, However, you know, these histories cross over, histories of empire histories of race, racism, all of those things cross over um, into things that interest me um, and the life of Churchill is one of those things that really do have has interested me for quite a while. Um, and so, as I said, this article was published in 2020 um, during and kind of after the major Black Lives Matter protests in the UK anyway. And Churchill was a racist, was sprayed onto the base of a statue of Winston Churchill in Parliament Square. Um, And then kind of because of that, the government um, and we could say they were forced, as is quoted in articles written about this moment, forced to temporarily encase it in a box um, whilst the um, protest kind of continued in the aftermath. in kind of fear of it being vandalised and torn down like Colston, which I think is very ironic that a statue, literally statue, metal um, objects, you know, wood or whatever statues are made out of stone, (laughs) is given the money and the time and effort of protection. Um, Yeah, it feels a bit ironic because there were just so many people that were not protected Um, that were protesting um, these things, yet it was a statue that gets protection. I've spoken about statues enough on this podcast, but it always strikes me the kind of irony of the fact that these are not the actual people. Like, that's not actually Winston Churchill up there. He's not being vandalised. Someone writes something terrible on a something you know that relates to him on a statue base it's actually not being written on him on his skin it's just a piece of stone but anyway it's not the point um you know and also I will know that it wasn't just in Britain that Winston Churchill statues were being defaced in Prague um 
on a statue, a Winston Churchill statue, outside the University of Economics, um, in a place called Winston Churchill Square. Um, he was a racist in um, the language there, was written on the base, um, and also Black Lives Matter was written. So that, for me, kind of suggests that at that moment, in 2020, the conversation was once again erupting about whether this man was a racist, wasn't a racist, should go down in history as a hero or a villain. Um, And so this article was my starting point. And Richard Toye made a really interesting point. um, And he mentioned, and it's something I mentioned at the start of my introduction because I thought it was important, that Churchill's resistance to the Nazis, his leadership during World War II, and all the arguably good things he did at that point, Point and in that moment, um, you know, his speeches, rallying Britain, getting America on side in World War Two, shouldn't be used as a way to argue that because he did those things, his racism is somehow inexcusable. You know, sorry, it's excusable. It's not excusable. You know, two things can be true at once. He can be a good war leader. He could have been a good war leader. And he could also have made racist comments. This notion that, as I said, he can be all heroic or or Valenius is not true. Um, and th- that will be the last mention of World War II, even though I said I wasn't going to talk about it. But it was a point that was made by Richard Toye, and I am borrowing, um, but an important one, I think, all the same. In my research process for this episode, I figured it was going to be a bit of a left and a right debate in regards to Winston Churchill being racist, because there are people that will, you know, die denying that he was racist and there's people that would might die you know um pushing the point that he was um and I'm probably as a young black woman in the UK um in echo chambers that are more left-leaning um and I hear very little from the right in regards to social media or the platforms that I tune into and the things I read and the publications I support and follow and so I figured I'd d- dive into the right-wing world <laughs> to find something out about this man and to to genuinely see what the kind of arguments for him not being racist were to, yeah, and from someone that has some expertise on the topic. And so um, I found a clip and I am just going to play most of it for you because it was just so interesting. Um, it's from The Telegraph and um, it's on YouTube and it's a series that they did Um, about kind of historical figures that have been um, suggested to have negative traits or have been tarred with a brush and he's kind of dispelling the quote-unquote myths Um, and so it's a series done by Steve Eddington um, and for this episode he's with the biographer of Churchill a man called Andrew Roberts who kind of comes on to defend him and Steve Eddington kind of plays the role of you know, here's what the left say, here's what the critics say, what do you think of this, what do you make of this, is it true? Um, But it is very much kind of positioned as a reaction to the left um, and their dismissal and condemnation of Churchill as a racist. Um, It pulls out the negative traits, as I said, negative comments um, and actions, and then um, Andrew Roberts explains essentially why they might be a myth, why they might be untrue, why they might be misquoted, or in the rare cases where he agrees and said that was a bad moment for Churchill, um, he does that, um, and it is rare when he does that, but he does, and I was quite, you know, happy for that, like, it felt, whilst you could kind of smell the bias through the screen, there was some understanding that there was a level of honesty to it, um, and then I cross-referenced my sources, with some of the um, biographies and uh, authors I mentioned earlier. And I think I've come up with a somewhat balanced, and by balanced, I don't mean, you know, points to say he was racist and points to say he wasn't. I mean balanced as in, you know, taking on knowledge from both sides of a political agenda in order to reach the conclusions that I am reaching today. And I'm saying this sounding like I'm sitting on the fence and being really neutral. can't lie, I'm not that neutral. I have a zero tolerance for racism. So any kind of sniffer of a racist comment, it's over for me. So, I mean, you know, if that kind of suggests where this episode is going, then so be it. 
And so here is a clip um, of Stephen Eddington posing some of the comments that people say made Churchill a racist um, to biographer of Churchill. So I've got some quotes here I'm going to read out that obviously people um, quote all the time to say, look, Churchill had these awful views on race. So in 1937, he said, I do not admit, for instance, that the great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race, a higher grade race, a more worldly wide race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. That comment there would allude to white supremacy in many ways of this idea of a white race, Britain um, and the empire being right to uh, invade countries like the US and the natives that were already there and countries like Australia with the indigenous population that was already there as well. He calls them black people, but um, I mean, now they wouldn't be called black people. They would be referred to as indigenous populations in both America and Australia um, and suggesting that the race that came after, which was the British, which was white people, um, were right to do so because they were just, you know, superior people and beat them out kind of, quote unquote, fairly and squarely in a way, um, because they were more advanced as populations. He also talked about, I hate Indians, they are beastly people with a beastly religion. He referred to Palestinians as barbaric hordes who ate little but camel dung. And somehow I don't think that needs much explaining from me, so you can kind of take that one at face value. And finally, he said, I think we shall have to take the Chinese in hand and regulate them. The Aryan stock is bound to triumph. Was Churchill a racist? No, he wasn't. And this is where I really wanted to stop the recording because, like, what in the world? But I'm going to let him finish, let him explain himself. You know, he is in this region. More of an expert than me. What do I know about Winston Churchill? Um, so here are his thoughts as to why, after those comments and remarks, Winston Churchill is not a racist. Um, uh, some of the quotes that you've given are completely invented, uh, such as the one about eating camel dung. Uh, others are, you fail to put in any kind of context whatsoever. Others are just made up by his uh, enemies. Almost all of the ones to do with India come from one person, uh, a political enemy of his, Leo Amory. I'm not saying he didn't say them, he might well have said something like them. But uh, the fact that um, uh, he said things that were derogatory to people of other races does not make him somebody who wants bad things to happen to people of other races, which I think is what a racist is. And this is where I just got fed up because that's not what a racist is. A racist is not someone that wants to cause harm to people of different races. That's just not the definition. That has never been the definition of racism in any way, shape or form. It is, you know, prejudice towards different groups of people. You know, it's discrimination. It's not that. So, yeah, I just don't know where you get off redefining racism to then fit Churchill into that new parameter of what you have defined racism to be. So that was my main issue with his argument. Um, the point he made about one clip being completely invented, um, the cow dung comment, I can see that being being true, being accurate. Like one thing I will say with this whole debate about Churchill being racist, and it's what I kind of thought might come out a lot is that things were misquoted or things um, didn't actually have a reliable source. It was just a, oh, uh, he said that in passing and it was recorded in a diary of a person that wrote that may not have actually have been there when he said that, allegedly. Um, so I figured there might be some hearsay as well. Um, and, you know, that only really applied to one comment, um, which wasn't necessarily even one of the kind of more well-known comments that people really come out and criticise. Um, he believes that the others have been taken out of context, which they have, you know. You pull out, what, a two sentences or a few sentences um, out of a speech or a letter or a written report, you know, that is taking it out of context. You are not understanding the comment, you know, with everything else that happened around it. Um, and I don't think that's fair to judge, then judge someone off of that. And so we will be diving into the context, which um, this man is going to kindly actually just explain for us. So, you know, he's really doing the work for me. I really hope this episode doesn't get taken down by copyright, please. But I just couldn't explain it better. And I think one thing I will say is a lot of 
people have such a love for Winston Churchill and a passion for him, I will never be able to talk about him with the passion that they have. So this is me letting him do his thing. Um, just to say that he thinks that white people were superior to non-whites is obvious, owing to the fact that he was born in 1874 whilst Charles Darwin was still alive. Um, and uh, it was the scientific belief that there were a hierarchy of the races. Now, we today know that that's obscene and uh, absurd, but in those days it was what was considered scientifically accurate. Um, some of your other quotations, the one, for example, about the, um, uh, the um, Native Americans, and uh, uh, that really is exactly what people thought about um, historical uh, development, that the more advanced, the more um, weaponized group was going to win uh, wars. By the way, I don't think that there are very many military historians today who think anything else. So, um, so no, if you treat Churchill as a man of his time and also... This man of his time argument really doesn't wash with me because, well, firstly, any person of their time believing, you know, whatever the status quo is within society will always be challenged by other people because there's always someone that disagrees. When slavery was a thing and it was, you know, of the time to think slavery was okay, there were abolitionists. So whatever drink they were drinking, whatever books they were reading, whatever things they were um, seeing, you know, I don't understand if, if, yes, the status quo and everybody else are believing one thing, why that has become a legitimate excuse for other people who believed something in something that is morally wrong and just unacceptable to say. Um, and I know we're thinking about these things in, you know, today's moral standards. But, sorry, but even at that time, people were criticising Churchill's views. People were calling him extreme then. So if they were calling him extreme then, the fact that we today in 2022 can see him as not racist is beyond me and not extreme in some of the views he was saying. And I'll pinpoint specifically the ones I mean. There was a man called Lord Archibald Wavell who believed Churchill's views to be outdated and old-fashioned, um, especially his views on India. Now, his views on India are probably the point of most tension for most people um, and some of his actions in, you know, what kind of ensued in India. Um, and the fact that India at this point is... Um, still not independent from Britain and um, still under British rule, um, really kind of highlights how important his views, um, being in politics at the time um, and, you know, being very close to the people and having a say in how India is run, how important it is that he's not racist and prejudiced against Indian people um, because it had dire consequences. Now, it was mentioned earlier by Roberts about um, him being a product of his time. Well, let's think about what was, you know, common of his time. And eugenics were brought up, this idea um, that racial science was a thing and certain races had been scientifically proven to be lesser, to be inferior. Coming off works of, of Darwin um, and, you know, people of that ilk that were using science um, to basically suggest um that some were better than others some were more superior and this was scientific it was based on your genetics it was based on um your brain shape it was based on all sorts of things um and eugenics just as a brief lesson is scientifically erroneous um and this is coming from the national human genome research institute um but obviously this is a modern definition at the time People didn't believe it was erroneous. They thought it was very accurate. Um, but it's now described um, as erroneous and Im an immoral theory of racial improvement and planned breeding, um, which gained popularity during the 20th century. Eugenicists worldwide believed that they could perfect the human race and human beings and eliminate so-called social ills through genetics and hereditary. Um, sorry, heredity. Um, and they basically believed in things like sterilization, segregation, social exclusion, or kind of quote unquote good breeding and breeding people that had the positive traits you wanted to see in society in order to rid society of its so-called ills. Um, and those ills were sometimes mental illness, 
Um, they were other things um, in relation to different kind of quote unquote abnormalities or defects or however they would be described and the kind of worst form of this eugenics is probably something you all have in your mind um the holocaust um and what the nazis did um in regards to jewish people um disabled people twins travelers black people um you name it anyone that didn't fit the kind of Aryan superiority, um, race, racial concept in science, quote unquote science, um, you know, was not said to be, um, uh, superior. They were not said to be kind of wanted. Um, and some of them were killed because of it. Millions of people were killed because of it. And eugenics kind of dies down as, as something after that, but it is followed by, a lot of not only people kind of on the right, but also left-wing people as well at the time where um, Winston Churchill would have been navigating society. And I'm just trying to put this into the context of him being a quote-unquote man of his time. As I said, eugenics were quite popular on the left as well as on the right, um, although it kind of looked different on the left as it did on the right. Um, uh, alongside people such as J.B.S. Haldane, who published mathematical papers on Darwinian evolution and suggested essentially the basic idea of IVF technology and cloning. Um, having worked in the field of popular genetics, um, he developed that discipline, um, which obviously later became IVF. Um, Eleanor Rathbone, who was a suffragist, politician and social reformer, was a eugenicist. Sydney and Beatrice Webb, who were English socialist economists and their husband and wife, um, early members of the Fabian Society, and they actually founded LSE, London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, so just a few of the kind of people that were part of eugenics, which whilst is pretty much said to be erroneous, some of the strategies that come out of eugenics are actually quite positive on society. Um, and don't actually look at removing groups of people. Um, they actually look at, like, nurturing um, children, such as, like, you know, campaigns um, for mothers to have the actual time to breastfeed their children. I think France had a policy like that because it was said that breast milk was better for children and would help in their development and their growth, and mothers should have time to do this, so on and so forth. Um, eugenics didn't always have a negative outcome of like let's remove these people from society there was sometimes a positive spin on that of like okay well here are the good things within society let's make time um, let's support these things so that um, you know people having children and people reproducing and that kind of thing is supported if that makes sense it's a minefield eugenics um something I studied very briefly at uni that was so interesting to me, but something I probably would never go back and do. Anyway, let's get back to the man of the hour, Mr. Winston Churchill. Now, I'm going to talk about his politics um, and what he did politically, just to kind of contextualise some of the things he said, which the man, the historian, argued that we haven't done. Um, and so I will start in kind of 1900, um, he's elected as an MP for Oldham, as a Conservative MP. Um, and it is important to know he started as a Conservative. However, in 1904, May 1904, he began to oppose the government's proposed Aliens Bill, or so it's been said, which was actually designed to curve Jewish migration into Britain from Eastern Europe, which we have an episode on. If you haven't listened to that, go and do it. It's great. Um, and I'm not biased. <laughs> But he stated um, that the bill would appeal to prejudice against foreigners, to racial prejudice, yes, Winston Churchill said this, and also labour prejudice against competition. Um, and he expressed that he was in favour of the old, and I quote, tolerant and generous practice of free entry and asylum to which this country has so long adhered and from which it has so greatly gained. Um, suggesting that this idea that, you know, having free entry and the borders being open was something positive. Anyway, so I'm sure that, amongst other reasons, led to him crossing the floor in 1904, 
defecting from the Conservatives to sit as a member of the Liberal Party in the House of Commons. Um, And it was during this time he was a junior minister in the colonial office. And it was here he was actually seen by some as left wing, which is why I mentioned some of those more left leaning eugenicists um, and people that believed in eugenics, because that's kind of where he would have slotted himself into. And at that point where those politics would have matched. Um, Now, left wing does not mean anti-racist. Let's not get that twisted um, today or back then. Um, and being liberal doesn't exactly mean he was a socialist or that far left-leaning. It just means he was a little bit more left-leaning than um, the Conservatives. Um, but he was seen by some um, as being left-wing. And he was actually seen by some as a threat to empire. This may sound hard to believe, but um, essentially um, at his kind of during his time at the colonial office, he tried to police and rein in the colonial government's treatment of non-white people. Um, in South Africa, um, which Roberts goes on to note actually in this next clip. And also appreciate the things that he did for non-white people throughout uh, his life and his belief in the British Empire. The fact that he put his life on the line endlessly to defend um, uh, non-white people on the northwest frontier, for example, and in the um, Sudanese campaign where he took part in the abolition of slavery, for example. Actually, overall, and down in South Africa, of course, where he opposed the the Boers, uh, overall, he was a tremendously good thing for non-whites, and uh, he wouldn't have been if he was a racist. So a common story brought up is about the Boers um, and South Africa and all that Churchill did for non-white people, um, which, yes, in some ways, you might want to argue that that makes, you know, you not necessarily want to see harm done to non-white people. But I don't think it atones you of all your racist comments that you've made in your life or you might go on to make or do. Um, And so I will leave that one there. Now, Churchill's politics and his political career continued, as you know. Um, This is barely even half the story. Um, In 1906... Um, the Liberal Party actually won the election and Churchill became the Under Secretary of State for, um, obviously for the party. Um, And then he was promoted to Home Secretary in 1910, which gave him control of the police and prison services. He later um, rejoins the Conservatives um, as an elected MP for Epping in 1924. So he kind of has this really long time with the Liberals, then goes back over to the Conservatives as if he can't make up his mind. But interestingly, and it's a key point and why I'm bringing it up, um, when he rejoins the Conservative Party, his kind of public opinions and his public thoughts seems to change. And in the 1930s, his opinions were really similar to those with strong imperialistic views, especially in regards to reform in India. This is where we have the problems with India and some of the comments he made about India. Um, And this was argued that it benefited his career to have these opinions to take this political stance Richard Toye um, the article the author sorry of the article at the start argues um, in one of his books Churchill's Empire that it was here he decided to and I quote become a Victorian Um, he's been born into the Victorian in the Victorian era which feels weird to say because he's always seen as like a more modern leader but he was around a while back Um, and so you know these comments and thoughts kind of fall into line. Even though prior to this, he's viewed as being potentially left-wing, potentially too left-wing, and a threat to empire. But then when we fast forward into the 30s and he starts to um, be part of this conservative um, party um, and wants to kind of fit in there, and this helps him advance his career, he takes on these really imperialistic opinions and views. you know, he's literally branded as a threat to empire. Um, And then he becomes a quote-unquote Victorian in his thoughts and comments. Um, It seems as he rose to the rank of prime minister, which obviously was not just due due to his imperialistic ideas and racist comments, obviously not, um, but his opinions on certain topics would have probably opened some doors that the left-wing version of Churchill may not have been able to open. Um... I don't know if it's worse that these comments may have just been to advance his political career. 
or they were actually his true opinions finally come into the light. We will never know. Um, however, comments were made. They were said and they were definitely said. Um, and I don't think it takes a genius to work out if they were racist or not. But we'll get into a few more, just in case you need some more evidence. Now, Churchill made other comments. Um, for example, people from India were the beastliest people in the world next to the Germans. And another comment he made, he did not really think that black people were as capable or as efficient as white people. Um, so clearly, you know, using these racial scientific ideas um, to create these opinions on different racial groups of people, which to me is definitely racist. Um, now, you know, sticks and stones, comments, okay, comments are comments, but I kind of want to think about how those comments then impact some of the things he did. Um, now, it's obviously I'm not in Churchill's brain, so I really can't tell you the ways in which things impacted him. But when you make so many comments about a country, especially a country like India, um, and then an opportunity presents itself for you to help India in their time of need due to a famine in 1942, and you don't use it, means it's very difficult to actually see behind your racist rhetoric and comments as just comments um and you know actually see them as very damaging um ideas that impact how you then treat indian people in their time of need in 1942 when they are faced with famine so in 1942 india is of course british um territory it's under the control of the british um and a cyclone which to cut a long story short causes food shortages due to roads and railway lines being cut and damaged um, and also at the same time an invasion by the Japanese on Burma, which was a major source of rice for India. So at this point, 1942, India just have a lot of food supply chain related issues. Um, and I will say before you listen to kind of what happens and what transpires that it's estimated that around 3 million people died as a result of this famine. Now Churchill's handling of this situation was what caused the issues obviously he didn't cause the famine um it was a result of the cyclone um and then food supplies being cut by the um conflict with the japanese uh well the invasion of the japanese um of burma um and so churchill seemed to kind of in some ways blame indians um for the famine through his comments he claimed that they breed like rabbits um which alluded to this idea that well you know it's their fault there's too many of them um that kind of line of um thinking um which is obviously um you know a racist comment a racist remark um according to robert who um the video that i've used to quote um when i carried on watching that um he suggested that he was only saying it to wind up his enemy leo amory um who robert argues was his kind of rival and he suggests that a lot of the kind of racist remarks or those people that would say the remarks were racist actually come from Leo Amory, who was just his enemy and just apparently wanted to see his downfall. Um, however, um, I think it's quite apparent that, you know, if your enemy's saying you said something in a time where he's also argued, remember, that he Churchill is a product of his time and a man of his time then that really doesn't actually mean that you know what was said was like less um reliable because surely if Churchill's a man of his time as Roberts argues then it doesn't actually matter if it's his enemy that is quoting him saying what he said um but that's my view on it so um you know Churchill could have obviously managed his famine better um and Roberts argues that he wrote letters to governments to help out, um, but the issue is, um, and the kind of main failing, is that he vetoed a Canadian proposal to send significant amounts of food to India, which would have obviously stopped the famine being as deadly as it was. Um, and instead, he told Australia that they should help out instead. Um, and the war cabinet ordered a build-up of a stockpile of wheat for feeding European civilians um, after they had been liberated. 
So 170,000 tonnes of Australian wheat bypassed starving India, destined not for consumption, but for storage. Um, And, you know, that is truly, truly awful. Because the food that was so desperately needed in India goes straight past India and isn't gone going to someone else to eat, you know, there and then. It's going to be stored. Um, which must have been, you know, if they knew at the time, such a slap in the face to India. Um, when three million people died as a result. That's just not something you can really kind of just pass over, is it really? Um, Churchill viewed um the kind of whole famine and everything as a distraction um he was preoccupied with battling germany in europe um and kind of didn't really pay the issue much attention um which is part of his downfall now some would argue that he deliberately withheld food as part of his um you know racist mindset um and his ideology that he passed saying things like you know indians are breeding like rabbits um however some would argue that he was just so caught up in war, which is one of the biggest criticisms of him, of being, you know, a bit war-obsessed and just kind of constantly caught up in the issues of war. He's battling Germany at the time. Um, And the issue is, there's actually been, uh, there's been many famines in the world, but the Irish famine 100 years previous, um, where Britain exacerbated conditions there, the same thing again has happened with um, Bengal and the Bengal famine. Um, and it just seems like no lessons were learnt, number one. And number two, it was the kind of racist rhetoric of Churchill that meant that India wasn't important, you know? The Europeans were more important. The food that they may need in the future was more important, um, as opposed to the fact that there were people dying of starvation there and then. Now, whatever you think about some of the comments made previously or your definition of racism, whatever that might be, I think exacerbating um, and not, or should we say not aiding um, the Bengal famine and people that were suffering and dying, three million people are estimated to have died because of this famine, um, and not acting accordingly, not acting thoughtfully, whether you, you put it down to carelessness or literal evil and racism, is is atrocious regardless it's atrocious um and so you know not to say Churchill was the only person that could have um done something there were other world leaders other governments that could have helped um but you know this is a British colony at this point um and the fact that Britain kind of stood by while three million people perished is absolutely abhorrent but I want to conclude I want to bring this episode to a close Um, Churchill has most definitely made racist comments and remarks and there is no but to follow that. That's a formal final sentence. But I wanted to leave you with comments from Richard Toye um, that I think are important in summarising this episode. And they are portraying Churchill as the root of all wickedness as some of the more extreme social media comments appear to do is as problematic as viewing him as a single-handed saviour of freedom and democracy. By elevating him to a place of supreme importance, albeit by presenting him as uniquely wicked rather than splendidly virtuous, it reinforces Churchill's own theory of history as driven by great white men. That is a vision from which surely we urgently need to break free. And whilst I agree with the sentiment there, um, and the idea especially that Churchill can't be boiled down to simple comments such as being a single-handed saviour or, um, you know, the root of all wickedness. I think you've got to look at him and understand the comments he made in the context he made them and the actions that he had, whether they were positive or negative. Um, Did Churchill make racist remarks and comments? Yes, he did, absolutely. Um, And that is what this podcast posed as a question. Does that make him a racist? I don't know. Um, It's something I grapple with in the idea of, you know, someone being a racist and that label being, you know, fixed and permanent. I don't like to think that any one person is fixed in 
such a negative um, state, although I do believe there are people that are, are genuinely deep down just racist and show themselves to be racist at every twist and turn in their lives. Winston Churchill, um, I think is there's too many complexities about him to necessarily label him as one thing, but did he make racist comments? Absolutely. Um, and did they cause serious harm to people? Absolutely. And I don't think that is something we can we can move away from. That is all for today's episode. I think that's absolutely enough on Winston Churchill um, and his thoughts and feelings. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a wonderful week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the History Hotline. If you've enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend to tell a friend. To continue the conversation about black history, head over to our social media platforms at the History Hotline on Instagram and at the History HL on Twitter.